Harinam Sankirtan everywhere. And we became famous for that, except in India. He didn't do it in India because he was thinking that in India they would simply see us as beggars. And going out on the street, people who don't have um, a place to live or are poor, they're out there singing, trying to make some money in order to get some something. So Prabhupada felt that the Indian nation culture would not understand, although it was foundational to their to their, to their practice that what we were trying to do. So he established that everywhere else in the world. And then, of course, the second, the, the second half of his first part was holy books. So Prabhupada's first part was holy books, holy names, simultaneously, starting with the holy names. How did the books actually become a part of our, our development? It was an accident. An apparent accident. In the old days, Prabhupada was still doing the Back to Godhead magazines. And so there were publications that were coming out regularly. Prabhupada was distributing them through his devotees. And they would go on the streets, and for those of you who are go way back to those days, I mean, 25 cents was quite expensive for a magazine. 10 cents, we would we didn't even accept 10 cents. <laughs> if you had a nickel, why not? <laughs> so, in other words, and we would give two out, uh, give out two sticks of incense. That was my first experience in meeting the devotees in 1970. The anti-war in Washington D.C. I got approached by a girl, a devotee. She gave me two sticks of incense and a pamphlet that I didn't understand anything about. Who was Krishna? Um, or who is crazy, and Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So in those days, it was just some articles in the back of the the magazines and that were formulated as a way to distribute Krishna consciousness. And then what happened in 1970, Prabhupada finished the Krishna book. Prabhupada was so excited. Now the tenth Kata was coming out, because Prabhupada felt that I may not be around to give the devotees the essence of the Bhagavad Gita, as well as Krishna's pastimes in the 10th canton. Prabhupada did this summary study of the 10th canton, which he called Krishna book. And when the, word, when the book came out, uh, Prabhupada was actually giving a lecture at the time when the book was released, and the devotees knew how much Prabhupada was waiting for that book. So they came right to Prabhupada during the lecture and brought him books and one box with ten copies. Prabhupada immediately turned his attention towards the book and started to hold it up and show it. And he sold it right on the spot all the time. <laughs> during the lecture. He didn't even keep one for himself. A little later on, the devotees, one devotee was traveling and they pulled into a gas station to get some gas. And uh, when it came time to make the payment, the gas station attendant came. They had no money. And so they were in a little bit of an embarrassing situation. So the devotee, his name was Premarnu, and he had a Krishna book with him. So he said, can you take this in exchange for the gas? And the man said, yeah. <laughs> and so, and then later on that story was related that we could actually give out books on the street. And that became the inspiration for distributing books. And later as Prabhupada was translating Bhagavad Gita and teachings of Lord Chaitanya and their devotion. And the devotees felt, oh, now we have a way to... And when Prabhupada first started the movement, when he wanted to distribute books, what did he do in New York City? He went to bookstores. He would carry his books to bookstores and ask them to put the books in the stores. And then he wouldn't even ask for money. He would say, if you sell something, you could give me it. But everybody would say, mostly everybody would say, you know, people are not interested in these spiritual books. So they would reject it. And once in a while, somebody would take it. So that didn't seem like a practical way or a viable way to get Prabhupada's books out. 
So then the idea of on the street center kind of started. The problem was built the movement on that, and then the money started to come in in sales. And Prabhupada's second, well, of course, the second and third parts of the movement that Prabhupada developed as foundation was <coughs> education. Education to teach the principles of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the lifestyle that centers around the, the devotion to Krishna as the foundation for education. Using Srila Prabhupada's books, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada, of course, was giving classes regularly wherever he was going, and also talking always about Krishna consciousness. And gradually, the devotees became more and more aware of the philosophy and the lifestyle, and started to practice it very seriously. So that was also in line with his Gita concept, where Gigandhi said that people who are below the uh, Vanashram system, such as the gave descriptions of people called the Bhangis and the Chalmers, those who are not allowed to worship or even to participate in the same social environment as the rest of society, they can be automatically given that uh, because they are Harijan, at least of the Harijan movement, which was to more or less to use a, a, a cliche rubber stamp people according to the idea that now they are qualified just because they are parts and parcels of Krishna. In other words, because they're spiritual beings. The Prabhupada saw that was incomplete. His idea was to qualify people in order to come up to the standards of the whole system of education. And that became the idea of initiation into the society. So, of course, education, evaluation, service, and qualifications, and then being required or acquiring the qualifications in order to accept, you know, this initiation. So that was the second part, is to educate, uplift, engage, and then eventually bring people into the body of the mother body of society by giving them education and initiation. That was part two. And that was the same. He, he took that also from Gandhi. And the third principle, which was temple worship. Temple worship. And Srila Prabhupada, as the money was coming in, Prabhupada wanted to establish temples everywhere. And gradually temples were opening everywhere, one after another after another. First in the US, Canada, and then of course in New York. Um, London and many other places, and then after some time, I went back to India to do the same thing. The Krishna Balaram Temple, the Temple in uh, Radharasa Vihari Temple, Mayapur. <clears throat> the Prabhupada's third part of his mission was to establish temple worship around the world. Not just simple temple worship, but Radha Krishna deities which was way beyond our ability to even come up to the standard of understanding how to worship the Supreme Personality of God in His most perfect form of God and Krishna. But Prabhupada was patient, <laughs> and he educated us, and then he, of course he was establishing. And that was also the third part of, Shil of um, Gandhi's movement, was to take the temples in India that were, had fallen down to a lower standard. Prabhupada writes about this in the year not of any concept. He said they had been, they, they had become dungeons for demons, where all these different Sahajian groups were coming into the temples and doing, as he said, their demonic dance. And Gandhi was also concerned at that time that the temples had fallen way below. So he made an effort to try to use the political, his political position to upgrade to, or get the support of the government, take charge and bring the temples back. But ultimately it was a failure. So Prabhupada understood how important it was for temple motion. He said when I came to the United States, he said I could have simply set a better tree in Chantari Krishna, but who wouldn't come? And no one would come. 
Or maybe a few really hardcore. <laughs> but the Prabhupada knew the importance of, uh, of uh, the Pancharachapi aspect of the uh, devotional lifestyle to establish in a very simplified way deity worship. So that was, these were the three main points that Prabhupada focused on education and eventually bringing people to the point where they can become devotees of the Lord and engage in devotional service and also developing the qualities of Brahma, the Brahma, the medical qualities. Temple worship, Gornitai, Chagana Paladip, Subhadra, Sitara, Lakshman, Hanra, Radha Krishna. Prabhupada really, really went beyond our ability in terms of establishing it. But he, had, he, had, he was very patient in trying to actually educate us at the same time. Because he saw the importance. And he saw that people would come simply to visit their own temples, to see the deities, to offer uh, something to the Lord to take darshan. And this would be a great opportunity for us to expand the whole Krishna consciousness movement. So with these three points, Prabhupada really established his movement. But the last part, which he talked about from the very beginning, which was a lifestyle in, uh, when Prabhupada was in 19, came in 1966, he penned these seven purposes of the ISKCON movement. And uh, I pretty much illustrated some of them in those three points, but one of them which was number six. He said to bring the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a more simple and more natural way of life. So in 1977, he spoke really many times about the importance of developing Varnashram. And he said our Varnashram system that means educating people according to their svadharma and bringing that svadharma into Krishna consciousness as daivi which means spiritual, working according to one's propensity and serving the Lord accordingly. And then, of course, he outlined the four principles, the medical qualities, those who have shakshara tendencies, those who are more inclined to commerce, banking, and farming, and of course, the sutras, which were, didn't need education, but just needed, needed engagement in devotional activities. And said, now Prabhupada wanted to go, in order to do that, he wanted to establish what was called Van Ashram College. And the Van Ashram College system worked in such a way is that after establishing a rabbinical culture, Prabhupada asked the Brahmins, who were leaders within the society, to educate the rest of the devotees accordingly in a systematic type of education where they could bring out these different qualifications that people had in the world that were actually lying dormant. Uh, and we're actually doing that now, but not in an organized way. But Prabhupada wanted to do it in an organized way. And that way the whole social foundation to our spiritual practice would be solidified in a way that everyone could find a place in Krishna consciousness, serve nicely according to their propensity, and also gain the education needed to do that, and contribute to worshiping the Supreme Personality of God and ultimately emotional service. So um, when Prabhupada left the world, just before he left, he said 50% of my mission is incomplete. Now, in 1974, he started to speak about this in a more direct way. But it wasn't until later that he actually made it a point. When, at one point, Prabhupada was seeing that devotees were coming, joining our movement, getting engaged in Krishna consciousness, but they were falling down. 
And he said, he said, if chanting Hare Krishna is so easy, why are so many people falling down? He said, now we have to establish this Vanarsha to engage people according to their nature and bring out as nature in a systematic way through education, guided by political, by persons who are in the leadership position. So, but it never really manifested in a real way, although there was some tent. But Prabhupada did say, it can only be done on our farms. He said, therefore we have to establish this Farm, these farm communities in order to bring about the culture of Vanarasa. And Prabhupada had a lot of faith in that particularly. He said by establishing these farms, we will have something solid to give, not only to the devotees, but to the world in general, a lifestyle which is based on the lifestyle which is the foundation for Vedic culture and spiritual practice. So I'll read one particular verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, this is one of many verses of the same subject. And this is from the first canto, chapter number uh, 8, verse number 40. This is prayers by Kurukunti. And she says, all these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance, the trees are full of fruit, the, flower, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals, and the oceans full of wealth. And then she ends by saying, and this is all due to your glance and over that. So now then, Prabhupada's purport. Human prosperity flourishes by natural gifts and not by gigantic industrial enterprises. The gigantic industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization. They cause the destruction of the noble aims of human life. The more we go on increasing such troublesome industries to squeeze out the vital energy of the human being, the more there will be unrest and dissatisfaction of the people in general, although a few only can live lavishly by exploitation. The natural gifts such as grains, vegetables, fruits, rivers, hills of jewels and minerals, and the seas full of pearls are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And he is and he and as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance or restricts them at times. The natural law is that human beings may take advantage of these godly gifts by nature and satisfactorily flourish on them without being captivated by the exploit and motive of lording it over material nature. The more we attempt to exploit material nature according to our whims of enjoyment, the more we shall become entrapped by the reactions of such exploitative attempts. If we have sufficient grains, fruits, vegetables, herbs, then what is the necessity of running slaughterhouses and killing poor animals? A man need not kill an animal if he has sufficient grains and vegetables to eat. The flow of river water fertilizes the fields, and the more is there, there and there is more than what we need. Minerals are produced in the hills and the jewels in the ocean. If the human civilization has sufficient grains, minerals, jewels, water, milk, etc., then why should we hanker after terrible industrial enterprises at the cost of, all, of labor of some unfortunate men? All these natural gifts are dependent on the mercy of the Lord. What we need, therefore, is to be obedient to the laws of nature and achieve the perfection of human life by devotional service. The indication by Kundi Devi is just to the point. She desires that God's mercy be bestowed upon them so that the natural prosperity be maintained by His grace. So here Prabhupada is outlining more or less the, the basic principle of this fourth part of the mission is to live in an environment where we're not dependent on all of the what we say, the industrial and technological arrangements that society has 
in order to squeeze out the vital energy of human beings and to and at the expense of most people and the few people being because of economic adventures. And then to go into the quality of that lifestyle as opposed to what we are experienced now is a whole different thing. Here we are in New York City. <laughs> Where is the, the problem to say, it's 50 years of having Kali Yuga. <laughs> you know, I mean, the rest of the world is trying to catch up in New York. So it is a place that you can see is simply based on economic development and sense gratification. The quality of life is just destroyed. And people have more or less uh, focusing simply on economic gain as success in life. And that's how society more or less values things. The more you have materially, the more you are considered to be successful. And that's a false sense of actually what is what really makes a person is their character. And not so much how much you have or how much you or whatever you are doing. It's the character. And then in order for that to develop nicely, uh, along with the practice of Krishna consciousness, as Srila Prabhupada said, we need an environment to stabilize the uh, lifestyle of the devotees in such a way that they can live free from all of the encumbrances that come by way of the demands of modern Western Metropolis, you know understand. And so Prabhupada pushed it. And then of course his first adventure was in the Udanami community. In the In 1977 when she was told that was like it was undergoing some difficulty with his health and it looked like he didn't he staying very long. Prabhupada got a research she thought I had a resurgence of health in September of that same year. And he decided, he said, now I'm going to establish this Vahasha. And so he left India, flew to London, and he stayed there for a while and did some preaching, but his health uh, actually failed. He was on his way to Gignan. He said, I'm going to show you personally how to work the land and how to live in a more simplified and natural environment. And he and then Prabhupada explained in, in many of his lectures and also in his books, he said, do four things. He said, grow your own food, um, make your own cloth. You can grow silk, you can grow cotton. And then from there, make cloth. The third thing he said, learn herbs. And he said, all of the medicines that, and all of the cures for all the disease are in nature. And along with it, the vitality that the human being needs is also provided by nature. Well, what we do, we work hard, we get something called paper, amount of money, right? It's got somebody's picture on it, and it's got numbers alongside of it. And we consider that wealth, but that's not wealth. That's just the government's idea of how to live in this way. And if the government fails, the paper is what it is, paper. That's all it is. It's an artificial form of uh, thinking that one is. And then for Prabhupada, the whole, he said, the whole Western world, and also, of course, now India also, is living on this false foundation of money. Money is the, what is that other word? Honey? <laughs> Wherever there's honey, there's bees. But that's not real wealth. Real wealth is land, cows, precious metals. That's actually real wealth. These things are foundational and not dependent on anything external. They are gifts coming from God. 
it's interesting. Um, how do jewels, gems, pearls, and many other things actually come to this earth? They come by rain. There's a particular constellation that's called Swati. And when that Swati constellation, constellation is in the, in, the, in the heavens, if it rains at that time, the rain falls on the head of a snake, it becomes jewels. If it falls on the head of an elephant, it becomes gems. And if it falls in the ocean, it becomes pearls and taken by oysters. So by rains, a lot of the precious metals, not all of it, but some of them are coming simply by, by God's arrangement through nature. And so that is actually wealth, not this commodity, material commodities are just supportive of the, of the like, false lifestyle that we're accepting in order to live in this world. But the foundation is, as Krishna has Prabhupada mentions in the Srimad Bhagavatam later on, three things make up a wholesome human civilization. God consciousness, worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in a very orderly and systematic way given by this volume of scripture and guru. A Brahminical culture, a class of people to lead the society who are living according to God's way, culture, they have knowledge, they have vision, they have um, the qualities of those who can lead by example. In other words, they exhibit spiritual and good material qualities. The medical culture, and the last one is cows. How important cows are. It's amazing. If you do a little investigation, so I'm not sure many of you know, having some experience, just how wonderful the cow is. I was giving this lecture maybe about a month ago, and I went one, I think it was in, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then one gentleman in the audience, he said, you know, in India, in some places, the cow becomes the actual member of the family. And when someone gets sick in the family, someone in the family will go over to the cow and whisper in their ear that this person is sick. The cow will go and find a particular herb that is the cure for that disease that the person has and eat that herb. And then she will give that milk and the milk is given to that person as a as the medicine. It's amazing. And he was he was talking from experience, not just from, from what he had heard after living in India. And then I made that statement again in another class. Somebody had said, No Maharaj, actually it's even it's even different than that. The cat doesn't even have to be told. He knows that this person is sick in the family and automatically she'll go over and eat that herb. Cows are amazing. They're the foundation for the economic development. So we have cars instead of cows. <laughs> of course, this is the way we live. And this is a required necessity. The Prabhupada could see the gradual withdrawal and the, the uh, rotation, or you might say, the deterioration of Western society. So he said, build these farms. He says, these are the future of our movement, the future of the world. And so he, he wanted for every temple, it's not that we stop the temples or even stop city activity. He said, for every particular temple we have, we should have a farm community aligned with that temple. And we can get all of our food and then supply all of our temples, make nice prashada, and distribute it, open restaurants. People will get very first class, you know, prashada from that. So Prabhupada wanted that, and he saw that this, he saw that the Western civilization was gradually in the community. In 1973, I don't want to sound too much like a false prophet or even a but Prabhupada said in 1973, 
He said, in 50 years, this Western civilization will be finished. That's an exact quote. And he said, and he said, because it's based on what money? He said, because money is the foundation for everything. He said, you've got money, you can do things. You've got money, you can go places. You've got money, you can cover all your mistakes. Money is everything. But that is not civilization. We know what civilization is devotees. It's relationships with others, living entities such as devotees, and ultimately our relationship with others, with God, with the Supreme Personality, which is the foundation of, for human development and human culture, along with the process of going back home, back to God. So, Thilabhava was somewhat of a visionary, not just a very powerful spiritual master. He could see gradually that in due course of time, we would be having to move into that direction. So he said, no, don't wait. Develop these small commanders. And not everybody could live on the front. That's right. It's just like that. When I was in, I, I stayed on the Nurendaga. I was in there in 1973. I came to Nurendaga and I stayed there until 1993. I was there 20 years. And then I left. One of the last things they said to me is they said, Chandramali, you're a city devotee. <laughs> After 20 years on the farm, <laughs> I found out my identity, at least on the social level. <laughs> uh, I kind of thought that was nice because I wasn't completely aware of it. <laughs> But it was. I was. I did my best, and I learned a lot. And I also saw the beauty of that type of lifestyle. And I could also see how how important it was to establish that as a as a way of livelihood for 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 most of our devotees. And Prabhupada said the farms are for the greenhouses mostly. Those who have families to raise children, the environment self-sufficiency, not having to go and, and work for the society and then somehow or spend so much time. He said, if you, he said, whatever you grow on your own farms is 100 times more nutritious than when you buy in the stores. So what do we do? We go and we make some, we go and we earn money and we buy food. So we do it in a roundabout way. But then again, the quality of what we get is not the same as what we could actually develop. So I just put together a little book. <laughs> it's available on the back table. It's called Nat Krishna's Way Natural Room. And I try to illustrate Srila Prabhupada's mission because he, he was very strong about that. He said to develop these farms. He said, this, this is the future of our movement, this is the future of the world. He said, society will not be able to sustain itself. And he said, why should we become dependent? And he said, the more you become Krishna conscious, the more Krishna will supply whatever you need. That's even true in this particular society. As we become Krishna conscious, Krishna takes care of his devotees. But Prabhupada understood as far as a lifestyle is concerned, which is supportive of our spiritual practice, he saw that living the way Krishna lived, more simply, growing food, taking care of cows, just like cows, we get, they say, Lakshmi Devi, the supreme goddess of fortune, exists within cow land. Cow dung is in one sense, in another way, to, to honor Lakshmi Devi. The cow is so amazing. It's God's special gift to society. And we can see, I mean, Krishna's planet is called what? Goloka. Not go New York. Or something like that. It's Goloka. <laughs> it's uh, the planet of the cow. So how dear the cows are. But Krishna knows how beneficial the cows are to human culture and human development and 
human prosperity. And so, in the cow dung itself, you know, all medicinal qualities are there. And people in India, of course, they take the patty, they, they mix it, they mix it with patty, and they take it, dry it out, and they cook with it. And Rabbi said, cooking with cow dung, first class. Cooking with wood, second class. When I was a new now when I was a cook, boom. I'm not a good cook, but <laughs> I was a cook. <laughs> I got criticized for my lack of knowledge, <laughs> you might say. And I was cooking with wood. It was nice. It was really nice. And you know, I want to say third class is gas and fourth class is electricity. I was just recently in farming today in Detroit area. And one lady, she was told by a doctor that don't cook on your electrical stove because if you're sick, it'll make you more sick. She was sick, and that the doctor was restricting her from that type of cooking because of the lunch was like, It's not really healthy in general. So we live in a very unhealthy environment. There's no question about that. We don't have to go through all of that. And so health is the foundation by which we can, you know, fulfill our desires in becoming Krishna conscious. And so cow dung is, is really, and you can take cow dung, you can process it to have a machine, and you can make methane gas, you can eat your homes, and you can also use it for, for other forms of, uh, for energy also. A cow provides everything. Cow walks on the fields automatically, if it does in a certain type of area where it's cultivated, that field becomes, you know, say ready for, for for crops. So maybe some of you have experiences in the cows and you know how wonderful they are. But they are the foundation for a human culture, a human society. So that's the unfinished part of Srila Prabhupada's mission is to establish these farms, give people and devotees a chance to live in that environment healthy and have more time for practicing Krishna consciousness and not be so much overly dependent on the external world for whatever we need. Koi, this is, this is a big subject and we can talk about it forever, but I think we are probably short on time. Anyone would like to uh, add anything or a question, any questions, comments? Yes, I mean, I only got like one comment, man. You know, you just remind me about growing up in Florida or whatnot, and there was a cow field or whatnot. And then when you say about the cow dung, I don't know, for some reason, like early in the morning going to school, smelling that, like, I don't know, it just reminds me of that, you know. Like everybody on the bus would be like, ah, and I'm like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, I was just breathing in, I'm like, you know, early in the morning, <laughs> you know. You were devoting. <laughs> Maybe they couldn't understand. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. The smell of cow dung is quite perfumey. <laughs> For those who have that sense. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else would like to comment? Uh, yeah. Uh, two things. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, uh, Thank you. Uh, one is you mentioned that uh, Grow your own food, make your own cloth, learn, learn yeah. herbs. What was the fourth thing? Uh, building your own houses. Uh, taking felled trees or dead trees and then ultimately, just like the Amish, they do it also. They build their own houses, they build their own barns and stuff like that. I mean, they, they can build a house in one day, they can build a barn in three days. If you learn, you can build your own house very quickly. It's not hard. The other thing was, uh, are there any ISKCON farms that are self-sufficient? There's some that are moving in that direction. For instance, Giedemann is trying to go in that direction, but they're still somewhat dependent on the external environment. New Rajadam in Hungary is moving. 
they have more than 45 different types of vegetables. They grow along with over 20 different fruit trees. And they also can a lot of it for the winter, they have a the whole system of keeping it throughout the winter. And when it's actually in place, in a working way, you don't have to work, or you just, four, four or five months a year, you do all of your cultivation, the rest of the year you do whatever you produce all year, and then in those four months. Yeah, and do Raja Dao also, there's other plants. The Wallis are doing it in a smaller type of groups. Two or three families are getting together and doing farms. Our Columbus, Ohio temple now is coming up, and they want to do that whole system of cows and lamb and cotton. So it's becoming more and more understandable. And it's actually the need of the time to become less. And I mean, I could go on on the whole day and just show you how the, the deterioration of Western society is really coming fast right now. I know, but it's, I don't want to bore you with all these statistics. So, the things are going down fast, there's no question. Prabhupada understood that, and so therefore he said, we will have to build these farms in order for and us, for our movement to continue. <laughs> Thank you. Brother Bhakti? How can we understand our natures and know what they are? How can we understand our needs? What is our nature? You were talking about acting according to one's nature. Well, we see that. We have certain abilities and tendencies. And once it's expressed in the form of service, you can see whether that you're inclined to that particular service or you're just doing it because you, you're asked to do it or it becomes a necessity. <coughs> Therefore, as Prabhupada said, we need this Manashram College. And the Brahmins, this was in 1974, you can listen to the lecture. On March 14, 1974, for one hour, he spoke to Riddhananda Maharaj. Maharaj was asking questions, Prabhupada was giving him the answers. And he said that collectively, the Brahmins should know all of the activities, and they can teach accordingly. They can also teach how to manage, how to fight, how to, how to raise children. In other words, whatever is needed as a society should be uh, learned by the Brahmins and taught in it. Not that every Brahmin has all of the knowledge, but collectively they have that knowledge. And then a college which will systematically teach these things, and by evaluation through the education system, then we can designate people accordingly. And that's the purpose of Guru Kul also is to see what are the qualities of the different children and then see how to engage them nicely so they can find happiness in the engagement and also fulfillment as a service. Yeah, so that was Prabhupada's idea of education in Mahashram College. But we're doing it right now, but they a very, what we say, unorganized way. There are devotees who are doing the medical service and devotees who are doing Kshatriya service, others are doing it. But it's not organized. It's just going on like that. And yes, there was another question I saw. A couple of more hands, yes? Where can we learn more about how to be more self-sufficient in terms of soaking on wood and different things like that. What does it mean to be more self-sufficient? Where can we learn how to? Well, know? you can go to the farms, the voting farms, and see how it's being done. And then from there you can get a practical understanding of seeing how the devotees work to develop it. I mean, it's being done in some of our farms. Also, the secular society is way ahead of us in doing this. Many groups within the society are, are actually pulling out and starting farms themselves. 
and you can learn from them also. They, the, the only problem is they don't have the spiritual foundation, which is very important in order to keep things together without the spiritual foundation. And material means variety, means personal interests, means hard to keep unity together. But they also have the understanding as far as the skills that they know, they know the skills that they know. Many of them do. What is it that only you said to do a little searching in the world? Thank you. Yes, Bonnie? disciples as they got older and so many people are, are, are not allowed to live in temples once they become a certain age and also if they're not if they don't have a family you know if they've lived in the, many of them have lived in temples or if they you know like it's, they a, need outline and it's, a duty, it's a duty as a society to take care of old people or those who cannot, you know, do what they used to do, they need a place where they can do something, but at the same time, not have be so mobile. It's our duty. It says if, you, if we don't give protection to these five classes of people, children, old people, women, cows, and Brahmins, then there is an offense. And that offense causes a, re a reaction. So society as a whole, if you talk about a holistic society, is required to take care of these kind of people and make sure they have everything they need to live and also worship. But uh, that has to be that has to be a, a, a program how to, how to take care of how to make sure those who are elderly and still have an opportunity to do service according to their level of you know, ability. Or if they want just some place to be where they can be associated with devotees. And I was just talking to my god sister yesterday at Rathi Ashram. She's, you know, she's in her 70s, pretty much by herself. She doesn't have a lot of support. She gets association every once in a while. But she has to go for it. And run again. So when we're in, when the environment is supportive, and that's what Prabhupada wanted with these farm communities, when people live together and support each other in Christian consciousness. The Western society is a nuclear family where everybody has their there's mother, father, children in one little place called your house or your apartment. Then you struggle to somehow take care of whatever you need to do. When you have community, community is supportive. That's the idea, especially a Krishna conscious community where devotees are always, always devotees always love to serve other devotees. It's just natural. The karmis will do that, but they'll always love for some material benefit from that. Devotees are happy just to do it as a service. Yeah, he's so long. God is waiting for <laughs> So thank you very much for your time and attention. Holiness <laughs> 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 <laughs>